And greetings to everyone here who, whatever season that God has you in, or whatever season that you're going through, during this season, this holiday season, a season that we celebrate the birth of our Savior, in fact, the birth of the Savior of humanity. The Creator of the universe came to the earth, Emmanuel, God with us. And I I was so blessed to be able to introduce my subject last Sunday, and those of you that were here, say amen. Amen. Those of you that have your Bibles with you, say amen. Amen. And if you do, if you would turn in your Bibles, and we're going to start back to where we started on Sunday morning in Mark chapter 6. Now, I, I, I realize that you may have heard, in fact, if you've ever been to church for any length of time, you have heard the sermon of the feeding of the 5,000. We know it by heart. But I'm going to show you some things that in my journey, in my studies, what God has shown me that were very illuminating, that had a lot to do with this season that we're in right now, right here today. How many of you, and you don't need to raise your hands because maybe a lot of what you would be praying for, believing God for, is not public information. But maybe you're believing God for something and you don't see a way through. You don't see in the natural or even in the supernatural. You see the Scriptures and you see that God did miracles in the Bible. But you wonder, when is it going to happen for me? You may be in a situation where that you're in a situation and you may be asking the question, Lord, why did you allow me to get into this situation. And as a believer, we believe that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. We believe that God knows the plans that He has for us. But that doesn't always mean that He tells us the plans before it happens. But He knows. And, and I'm preaching tonight to people who are in that situation the scenario. You have something in your life that you're believing God for and you have not seen the miracle or the breakthrough. And off the top of my head, it could be a relationship, a marriage that needs to be reconnected. It could be a lost loved one, a lost child, a lost parent, a lost sibling, a lost brother or sister. It could be a financial reverse. It could be something that in the natural you look at it and you say, I don't see any way around this. If you remember a few weeks ago, I was talking about in the Scriptures how that when Jesus came to the tomb where Lazarus was, and before he came to the tomb, he was met by Martha, and he said to Martha, he said, I am the resurrection, and the life. What he was saying was resurrection was not just an event, but resurrection was a person, and that person is Jesus. Well, that was part of what Moses started back in the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus chapter 4, when when God appeared to Moses, and he said, and Moses said, who am I going to say he sent me? And God said, tell them, I am that I am. And if you look in the book of John, there are several of these I am statements. And the very first one is found found in John chapter 6, and we're going to look at it in Mark chapter 6, and I end a little bit in John chapter 6, and it's where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And the Lord showed me something, and I, and I hope that it's just as exciting to you as it was to me when the Lord showed it to me. And, and I, we started in verse 29, and I'll, and I'll start there again tonight and read 
as quickly as I can to get us through this because we've got a couple of verses that we're going to be covering. St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 29. Please stand, if you will, chapter 6, verse 29. Stand, if you will, for the reading of God's Word. And when his disciples had heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and they laid it in a tomb, talking about John the Baptist. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and they told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a, des into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed. And you know, I, that, that verse stuck out to me today as I was reading it again, how that they couldn't even, they didn't even have the time to eat. And he's getting ready to feed them. In this 24-hour period, just a magnificent event took place. Verse 32, and they departed, this is Jesus and his 12, departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing. And many knew him and ran afoot thither out of all cities, out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place. Now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And Jesus answered and said unto them, verse 37, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And he saith unto them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, verse 38, those four words, And when they knew, they said, five and two fish. Father in heaven, heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, my Lord and my Savior. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would anoint my lips to speak your oracles, that you would grant me the gift of prophecy here in this moment. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would bless this service with your presence, and I ask that you would flow through me with the power of your Holy Spirit, that every word that I would speak would be your words, that you'd fill my mind, my thoughts, my heart, my words, my actions, that I would glorify and honor you in all that I say, and that it would be your words and your message to these, your people in this moment. Heavenly Father, open up heaven, reveal to us your plan for this service. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to minister. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to seek you and your word and your wisdom for this congregation. I thank you for, that we could come together in this moment and we would come together in the name of your Son, Jesus. We ask by virtue of his name that you would honor us with his presence and the presence of your power. In the name of Jesus Christ, all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. I like those four words. And when they knew, I always get things that are sent to me. Text messages, emails. And the other day I received an interesting article that's found in Ford's magazine, February 2020. You know, this is an interesting year. Would you, say, would you, would you agree? Interesting year, but a disruption does not have to be a distraction. When we ended 2019 in the room back there, and Pastor Gary was there, and Pastor Doug was there, and many of us, many of you were there, we were praying in the, the new year, and we sat down and we made goals for 2020. Some of the biggest, most lofty goals that we'd ever made. 
And we look at those goals and many of you will say, ha, 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 you prayed for more time with your kids, and if you don't have a, jo a job, that's what you got. <laughs> your prayer was answered. But none of this was a surprise to God. 2020 was not a surprise to God. You know, an another thing, too, whenever Pastor Carol was talking about how that and this is this uh, this is a little bit off the subject, but I'm going to say it anyway. And I don't usually get into this because this is really totally out of my pay grade, but I'm going to talk about it. You, I'm going to tell you guys something. The church, you cannot call the worship of God in the assembling of believers non-essential. This, this is non-negotiable. And to embrace that thinking puts you as a believer into a secondary, substandard position. One of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now in the body of Christ is that we have, we have taken that hook, line, and sinker, and it's not from God. The church, the body of Christ, the worship, if the founding fathers believed that this was an essential part of our system, our foundation as a nation, that they put it into the Constitution of the United States, and it is non-negotiable. You cannot tell me that going to a restaurant and eating in a restaurant or shopping at the Target is essential and worshiping God in the house of God is not. The challenge, and this happened on our watch. But I think that God's given us an opportunity. An opportunity for we as His children to rise up and say that we know whom we believe, and we will worship him. No matter what the laws of man may say, they can take you and throw you into the fiery furnace, and we will not be burned. This isn't the first time that governments have tried to make laws against worshiping God or against coming together in an assembly to praise the Lord. This isn't the first time that this has happened. When they knew what they had. You know, I think a lot of times, the reason why people get, quit going to church is they don't know what they got. That's the reason why many times people go through divorce. They don't realize what they had. They lose their job. They don't realize who they got or what the job they got. They don't realize who their spouse is. They don't realize what they have. An article was sent to me in Forbes magazine, February 2020, and in the article, a young man by the name of David, 18 years old, enlisted in the military in 1971, and the reason he enlisted is because he was number seven on the draft pick, and if he enlisted, he would get to go into the Air Force. He goes into the Air Force. He's stationed originally in the early 70s in Thailand. And there in Thailand at the military base, he had always had an admiration for nice, expensive watches. But he didn't really have the money to do it. At the time, his pay was about three to $400 a month as a serviceman. But he saved his money. And in 1973, he was able to buy a beautiful Cosmograph Rolex Oyster Perpetual. It cost him over $300. He took it back to his barracks. He looked at it. It was so beautiful, he was afraid to wear it. So he took it, put it back in the box with all the receipts, put the box in the bottom of a footlocker, put it into storage, and forgot about it. Well, as the years went by, things would happen in his life. 
He forgot about the watch. At one time, there was a time when he would go and he would look at it, but that time had passed, and he's getting older, he's at retirement, and but things go bad for him. He's taking care of his parents, and they pass away. No money to feed himself. He finds himself homeless, living in the streets, begging. Then he remembered. Stored away in a footlocker was that watch that he'd had. And he's wondering to himself, is it worth $350 now? Is it worth maybe $500? Because to him at that point, that would be a lot of money. He digs through his stuff, and he starts to go through everything. And he doesn't find the watch, but he finds other things. Memorabilia, pictures. Things that he had when he was a young man, when life was much simpler, more prosperous. Finally, in the bottom of a footlocker, he finds a little box. He pulls it out. He opens it up. And to his surprise, the watch is still there. He can't believe it. It's just as beautiful as it was the day that he bought it. It looked brand new. And he didn't really know what it was worth. He didn't really know what to do with it. And he was hoping in his heart, maybe he could get $500 for this watch. Well, he heard about, one of his friends told him about, this antique road show. Now, I know some of you probably saw the video. So he takes this watch to the antique road show. Really, no money in his pocket. No bank accounts. Living in the streets. And he shows it to the man, and the man looks at it. He looks at all the documentation. And he takes a step back and he said, where did you get this? And the story that I just told you unfolds. And the man shook his head and he said, this is worth three quarters of a million dollars. And the man passes out. He faints because he's thinking of all the nights that he spent sleeping in the streets. All the nights that he went to bed hungry. All the opportunities that he missed. Because he didn't know what he had. He didn't know what he had. And here in this scripture, it doesn't really make sense in the natural. Jesus, all God, knows everything, all man. He tells the disciples, we're going to go to a deserted place. And when they go, 5,000 people plus women and children show up. This wasn't a surprise to Jesus. It was not a surprise to Jesus whenever they showed up. And on the hillside, he's preaching to them. And the Bible says that he preached a long time. To the point that the day was actually ending. The disciples come to Jesus. They say, Master, the people are hungry. Why don't you let them go? Well, hold on a second. Why is it that Jesus didn't tell his disciples before they took off on this trip to pack some lunches? We're going to need food for 5,000 men plus women and children. He knew that. And the disciples, they're, 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 they're following him, and, and they're, not only do they not have food to eat, but the people don't have food to eat, and Jesus is saying to them, this is interesting, Jesus says to the, his disciples, you feed them. Now, I want you to see something that I had never seen before in my entire life. If you look, in, and we're going to go back and forth from St. Mark's Gospel to St. John's Gospel, because if you watch this, the um, St. John chapter 6, if you watch how that these two books are synchronized, you, you're going to see some revelation tonight. You're going to see something that God is going to show you that will enable you to be able to have the faith to trust Him to get through this situation, whatever it is that you're going through. So let's look at verse, St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 37. 
And Jesus answered and said unto them, Give you them to eat. Now turn over to St. John's Gospel. Hold that place right there. Because Mark and John both captured the same event from different perspectives. And both of them covered the same dialogue or the same conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. Look at verse 5. Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw the great company come unto him. And he said unto Philip, now this is a conversation that he's having with Philip. Where, this is where shall we buy bread? Where? Where? Where are you going to get it? Where are you going to get the bread? You ever notice how that in the Bible, every single time that they would ask God a question, that God would come back with a better question? What did Abraham say? He said, how can we have children at this age? Genesis chapter 37. And God said, is anything too hard for God? That's the right question. You see, every thought is predicated by a question. Every thought is predicated by a question. And the questions that we ask have to be the questions that are correct. Is anything, the same thing happened to Moses. When Moses said, how are they going to know that I came from you? What did God say? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? So Jesus says, where shall we buy bread that they, that these may eat? Now John's, I I love John because he's always throwing these little commentaries in to help us to understand it a lot better. Verse 6, John throws a commentary in, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew this the whole time. Jesus knew that they were going to go on the water across the the Lake Gennesaret to the other side. They were going to go and there would be thousands of people waiting for them. And they would all be hungry. And there would be no food to eat and no place to do it. And Jesus allowed them to get in over their natural understanding abilities on purpose. Jesus, I can't believe you'd do me like that. Why'd you let this happen? Now, what's, what's really interesting, because the Bible says, verse 7, or in John chapter 6, verse 7, Philip answered him. Two hundred penny worth. Some translations are going to say eight months pay. The reason that it says eight months pay or two hundred penny worth is that a penny worth or a denaro or a shackle or whatever you want to call it, was one day's wage. So Philip answered him and he said, I've calculated this and 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take, may even take a little bite. A bite. One translation says, a morsel. That wasn't the question. Jesus didn't ask Philip, how much is this going to cost? Jesus didn't ask him, how much money do you have? What's this going to take to get this done? That wasn't even the question. The question was, where are we going to acquire bread? I've got a little bit of Philip in me. (laughs) Because every time God tells me to do something, I'm figuring out, well, if I do this, and I save this, and I do this, maybe we can all have a small little bite. If I budget this, and I don't pay that, I can do this. But that wasn't the question at all. The question was, where? Where? Now, let's go back to 
St. Mar Mark's Gospel, because to understand the interaction, the dialogue, the conversation that they're having, you've got to go back and forth to see this. Jesus is saying to them, where can we acquire the bread for these people? He didn't want to know. He didn't ask how much is it going to cost. He didn't ask how much money do you have. He didn't ask are there stores open down the street. He asked, where are we going to buy the bread? Watch this. It gets, it gets real good here. Verse 37. And he answered to them. This is the same conversation. He answered to them, give them to eat. And this was in the same conversation when, when he said, where are, you gonna, where are we going to buy the bread at? The next words he said after that were, you feed them. You feed them. Give them to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. God will never ask you to give what you don't have. God's never going to ask you to do something that you don't have the capability to do. God is never going to send you into a situation where that you're going to be in over your head. Now, in the natural, you may think you're over your head. You may think that it's not going to work out. Jesus said to them, he said, go and see what do you have. And when they knew, how'd they know? I've tried to get a visual image as how they figured this out. I mean, there's a lot of people there. And I can just imagine that these people are all, this is like a stadium full of people. There's probably 20,000 people there. And these people are all scattered across there. And the disciples have been given the instruction of figuring out how much food, how much bread, what is there. Now, what's interesting to me is you've got 20,000 people there, and pretty much nobody's got anything. No food. They're out in the middle of nowhere. The day is spent. It's the end of the day. And Jesus is saying this, go and see what is out there. Did they go to the little groups and they say, what do you got? What do you got? You got any bread? You got any, any fish? You got anything, anything at all? What do you got? Finally, it was Thomas. He found a young boy that had five loaves and two fish. And they bring this five loaves and two fish and the young boy. In verse 38, how many loaves have you? And go and see. They go and see. And when they knew, they said five loaves and two fish. And he commanded them to sit down by companies upon the green grass. If you look in uh, St. John's Gospel, he says that They sit down on plenty of grass. I, I, if, look, look at this. Look at verse 9, St. John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 9. And there was a lad there which hath five barley loaves. And, and it's interesting that they put the word barley loaves because barley was the cheapest loaf that could be acquired. That was the cheap stuff. He had five barley loaves and two fish. And Peter said, or Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said, but what are they, what is this food among so many? We don't got enough. Okay, Jesus, we did what you said. We went and we calculated 
all the bread. This is like a joke. I mean, there's 20,000 people there. There's five loaves and two fish. This, this is nothing. You know, first, Philip's idea, now it didn't sound so bad. At least they would have each got a bite. A bite, a morsel. Now this isn't even going to be a morsel. This is going to be a crumb, less than a crumb. What are you doing to this young boy, Jesus? And, and, and Andrew brings up the, he brings the, the young man in, and he brings the young man, and he says, this is not going to be enough. It, what, what is it going to do? But they calculated what they had. They calculated the numbers of what they had, but they didn't actually know how much that they had. And this is where it really got me. Verse 9. There was a lad which hath, we're in John chapter 6, verse 9, had five barley loaves and two small fish. But what is this? But what are they among so many? And Jesus said unto them, make them sit down. Now there was much grass. I don't know why John put in there much grass. I, I, I guess when you, when you don't have a lot of food, you got to have a lot of something. Amen? <laughs> You can't eat the grass, but they had much grass. And I don't. And Mark put in there green grass. I don't know if maybe he was trying to bring us back to the 23rd Psalm. But where the Lord is my shepherd, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I'm not sure as to what Mark was thinking, but we know that it was the grass was green and there was a lot of it, but there wasn't much food. And what Jesus, the lesson that what Jesus was saying was this. I brought you all out here into a place, a deserted place, and I have put together this revival, this series, and I know the people are all hungry, but I want you to recognize that there is something that feeds us all that is much greater and much more powerful than the bread that even was given to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And that was the message that he preached in John chapter 6. For the bread that they ate in the wilderness, when they would eat it the next day, it would go bad. And what Jesus was saying was this, sufficient is the day, today, of all the events that we're going to go through today for today. Whenever you look at any life that is what we would consider in the natural to be successful, or you look at any ministry that's successful. I remember when I used to work for my dad's ministry, and every time that I would go to a church, I had a list of questions that I would ask the pastors of the churches. And I would sit down with the pastors, and many of them were very successful, and I would, I'd had a list of, of five questions that I would ask them. But one of the things that they all told me over and over and over again is this, that you will always be facing challenges every day. That today is going to have challenges. And don't be looking at the challenges of tomorrow, because today the challenges Today, God will give you what you need for today. But the challenge is that tomorrow, when the tomorrow comes, God will give us the bread that we need for that. What Jesus was saying to the disciples was this. You, you can make all your plans. You can pack all your bags. You can get catering services. You can get savings accounts. You can make all your plans for 2020. But at the end of the day, I'm the bread of life. At the end of the day, I'm the source and I change not. Now, Jesus, part of his compassion was revealing this to his disciples little by little because had he revealed it to them all at once, it would have been too much. And as he's revealing this to them and their faith is growing, they're beginning to see and lean and rely on the Lord because now that they're seeing that he is the bread of life. He didn't become the bread of life. I can prove that. It's in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was always the bread of life. He was always the source. 
He was always, many times when we're looking at what in the world, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? What God wants us to do is take a step back and take inventory of what he's already given us. This is one of the reasons why that whenever I, in, in business, when I look at what I have, the sales that I have, the customers that I have, I look at it, it's enough because that's not my source. When I look at what God gives me and what God has trusted me with, it's enough because God is our source. Rather than focusing on we don't have enough, it's going to cost more than we have. We, can't, we cannot calculate this. It's not going to work out in the natural because in the natural, none of this is ever going to make sense. But in the supernatural, in the spiritual, when we plug into the fact that He is the bread of life, that He is our source, that He is the way maker, that He is the promise keeper, that He is the source, He is the provider, that it is Him that is the bread of life, that it is not the bank, it is not how much money we come up with, it's not a scheme, it's not a plan, it's not some system that we figured out, it's not something that we did, that sometimes you're going to get in a situation that in the natural it doesn't look like there's any way out. What He says is, what do you have? What do you have? You know, a lot of times people don't get involved with the choir because they don't think they can sing. What do you have? A lot of times people won't do things because they don't believe they have anything. If we don't recognize what we have, then we become unthankful, ungrateful. But every time that we thank God for what we have, we recognize His goodness in our life. We recognize the miracle that He has taken place. We open the door for God to do more. And every time that we recognize that He is our source, we open the door for Him to flow through us in a greater and more powerful way. The lesson that is learned from the feeding of the 5,000 is the lesson that Jesus is the bread of life, that He is our source, that it, with Him little is much. When it's in his hands. And that's one of the things. You know the Bible doesn't say anywhere. That they came back. And five loaves became seven. And seven became twelve. And twelve doesn't say that. In fact. The Bible says. That they continued to go back to Jesus. And when they did. It never ran out. Mark chapter 6, verse 40, and let's start with verse 41. And we had when he had taken the five loaves, Jesus took them, and the two fish. You know, taking five loaves and two fish would be like me giving you two nickels and telling you to make your, your house payment. Or pay off your credit cards. But Jesus didn't turn up his nose at the five loaves and two fish. He didn't turn up his nose when the widow brought in the two mites. Because he knew what this rep represented. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, verse 41. He looked up to heaven. And he blessed it. They didn't know what they had until they went and found it. When they found it, they gave it to Jesus. It wasn't enough for what they needed, but he still blessed it. You know the best way to bless something? You know, I, I, I can tell you this is, this is real easy. Start speaking God's blessings over the areas in your life that are not enough. Start to, like Abraham, calling those things which be not as though they were. When you look at your bank account, rather than saying, this is not enough, or if I can do this, 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 and this, rather than this, that, speak God's word. 
my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. And bank account, bank account, bank account in heaven. Can someone say amen? Bank it, lay for yourself, not treasure, not, not treasure on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay for yourself treasures in heaven. Whenever he took the five loaves and the two fish, he blessed it. Bless what you have. Recognize it. Appreciate it. Thank God for it and bless it. If you're having trouble with a a child or a parent or someone in your life, rather than talking about how bad they are, try blessing them. Try blessing your spouse. Try blessing your children. Bless your church. If you don't like something here at the church, try blessing it. Speaking God's blessings over it. Speaking it over your business, over your family, over your home, over your finances, over your health. If you're not feeling good, start to put your hand on and say, by his stripes, I'm healed. Bless your body. Bless your health. Bless what you have. And you may not feel like it's enough, but bless it. That's what Jesus did. He spoke the blessing. He blessed it. It wasn't enough. And he led them there. He took them there. They were in, Jesus, why'd you do this? So he could show them that if they bless, and he blessed it, and then he broke it, broke the loaves, gave these to his disciples to set before them, the two fish. You know, it's almost like the fish are an afterthought. They're just like thrown in there. <laughs> and he divided he among them all. Who divided it? Jesus divided it. He took it. He broke it. And it was enough. I'm going to show you how much it was. And they all did eat, verse 42, and were filled. One translation says they had all they wanted. <laughs> I tell you, that's where I want to live. You know that book, what's that book, um, Five love languages, five languages of love. God's love language is trust. Trust. He says, if you'll trust me, if you'll trust me, if you'll trust me when things don't look like they're supposed to be working out, when things don't look like they're going to work out, when things don't look like th that you're going to make it, when it doesn't look like your finances are going to make it, when it doesn't look like you're going to be able to make it through this with, with your health and your health issues, when it doesn't look like, and I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of times people are saying, well, you know, the, the, the devil killed so-and-so. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. The Bible says the number of our days he will fulfill. God will take us home when it's time. The devil's not going to climb up here and take you guys out. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. God protects us. It's His hedge of protection that watches over us. It's His hand of healing that sustains us and restores us. And if you're going in, a, if you're in a situation where you're facing challenges of health, you're facing challenges with your finances, you're facing challenges in your marriage or your relationships, or maybe challenges at work, or maybe you don't have work, or maybe you're confused in your mind and you're going through depression, or maybe you're trying to figure out exactly whether or not you want to work or not work, or go to church or not go to church, or be in a relationship or not be in a relationship, and you're just not sure. My words for you tonight are this. Go and see what you got. Appreciate where you're at. Recognize God's goodness in your life. Look for it in everything that you have. The air that we breathe. The people that we have in our life. The goodness of God. His grace. His protection. You know, I could preach all night just on the things that God protected me from that I don't even know about. 
the places that he kept me from, his hedge of protection, his enlightenment, the open doors, the open opportunities, the ways that he made where that God took what was little and he made it much, where he sustained us when he didn't, when others were not sustained. And if we find out what we have, all of us can say, we have a lot to be thankful for. And I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm glad and gracious that I have so much to be thankful for because I know that whenever I'm thanking God, that God hears my prayer. He hears my thanks because the Bible says we enter His gates with thanksgiving in His courts of praise and being in His presence. We know that in His presence is perfected peace. In His presence is healing. In His presence is restoration. And in the presence of the Creator of the universe, we can see mountains move. We can see God do things that in the supernatural, we, man would not even understand because I hath not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered into the hearts of man the things that God has for those of us that will believe him. And then as you believe him, as you believe him, you'll see your children will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You'll see that your finances will turn around. You'll see that debts that you've had in your life for years will be paid in full. You'll see that you'll have clear thinking. You'll see that depression will go away. You'll see that God will comfort you in the dead of the night. You'll see that God will raise you up. He'll restore your soul. He'll take you from where you're at and he'll set you on a mountain where that you can be the stability for the community, for the family, for the church, for the people. Because God is not a man that he can lie. God is not movable or shakable. God is not moved by what's going on in Washington, D.C. God is not moved by what's going on on the news. He doesn't even care. Whenever we're going into this thing, we get all bent out of shape and all worked up. I can tell you God doesn't. God does not. God is in charge. He's in control. And he wants to flow through us. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody moving around. I want to tell you that this evening as we look at the very power and the presence of God, when God was able to feed the 5,000 people, he did it because his disciples Believed and they obeyed. That's really all he wants is for us to trust him. But I believe here in this auditorium that there's going to be people that God is going to raise up in this 2021 as we're moving into the new year, that God is going to raise up people to do great things. I believe that a lot of believers, a lot of Christians, a lot of people who are not believers are going to get left behind. And if you think 2020 was bad, for some people 2021 is going to be even worse but not for God and His children who trust in Him because the Bible says in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your... Because with God's direction, we can't fail. As a congregation of believers, this congregation will first grow in strength and power of His Spirit, before we grow in anything else. We will grow deeper in Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I believe that there's some of you that are going through things, and I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands because I believe that a lot of people don't want people to know what's going on in their life. And I I respect that. You know, the Bible talks about the secret petitions of our heart. Some of the things you're only going to tell God in the secret place. And then when you go into the closet and you close the door and you cry out to God, some of the things and even your spouse won't know, your children won't know, your parents won't know. But it is that place, that petition in your heart where you seek God and you just don't know. You haven't seen the miracle, the breakthrough, and you're believing Maybe it's for a healing of a spouse. Maybe it's for a healing in your finances. Maybe it's for a healing in your, in your body, your marriage. And you've been believing God and you haven't seen the miracle. Jesus is the bread of life. That means he is life. I'm going to pray a prayer and a, and a prayer of declaration over every person that's here because I believe that it is that God wants us to go into this 2020 as holy warriors and powerful, powerful warriors for the kingdom of God. God has equipped us 
He's given us the tools. He's given us faith. He's given us the weapons of our warfare. He's given us everything that we need. And right now, the, the prayer that I pray tonight is we are going to go and find out what we have. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that we would return to that place where we seek you on our face, where we seek you in humility, where we seek you with a gracious heart, where we seek you with an obedient spirit, with a servant's heart. And Heavenly Father, show us, reveal to us what we have, the greatness that we have, your goodness, your spirit. Father, there are some here that need miracles, some here that need breakthrough, some here, Father, that need assistance in their, in their finances. Some need a miracle. Some, some came here just by the skin of their teeth and they, they need a miracle and they've been believing you for a miracle. I ask Heavenly Father that, that I would join with them in their faith and their trust in you and that, that they would recognize what it is, what it is that you've already given them. And we give you thanks for that. And rather than complaining, we're going to be rejoicing. We're going to be thankful. In the name of Jesus, God, God's people said... God bless you.